This morning, we're going to begin with more pictures of promise. Too many beautiful, glorious pictures of promise in the Bible to fit into 45 minute sermon. We're going to be reading in uh, Psalm 127. If you want, you can turn there. We'll be reading there in a moment. God's purposes in these pictures. These are spirit-inspired pictures of God's will for you and for your family. In them, when we look into them, we see. As we see, God creates desire in the heart. With that desire in the heart, we begin to move in the direction of that which we see. That is how God uses vision to move His people from where they are to where He wants them to be. When that desire, with that desire, the heart is opened up to instruction and correction. This is the reason why we are staying so long on the visionary aspect of our home, so that when we get down to the nuts and the bolts where instruction, where correction is given, our hearts will be willing and open to hear and receive deeply what we are being given. Sometimes that can be painful. Vision helps us to bear that pain because we see something and because we see it and desire it and we want it, we are willing to bear the pain of facing our failures and thus we will get the gain of taking steps forward in our homes. That's the purpose for all the emphasis on vision. Now let's read in Psalm 127 as we look at some more pictures of promise in the Bible. Psalm 127 and starting in verse 3. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Hallelujah. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. Glory. We want to look this morning to begin with here at carefully prepared arrows. God begins with some lofty statements about our children as we have read here again showing us the value, the precious value that He has placed upon children. And then He follows it with several analogies. And I would just like to make the comparisons here before we go any further. We see in this text a physical war. But we also, with the eyes of our heart, being New Testament Christians, we also see that there is a spiritual war. That spiritual war is more important than any physical war upon this earth. Oh, that God's people would understand that. We also see an enemy in that war. And yea, we have our spiritual enemies also. There is a man in this war, as we look at these verses, and according to the scriptures, that man is a spiritual father. A spiritual father. And lastly, there are weapons in war. And the weapons in this spiritual war that we're speaking about, those weapons are our children. Those weapons are our children. Don't forget that, brothers and sisters. There is a war. We have an enemy. We are in this war. And those weapons are our children. Hallelujah. We must understand life 
in Israel a bit to understand the depths of the meaning of these verses that we have read. In Israel, in Bible days, every able man was expected to go to war. And they prepared for it. Young men, from the time they were boys, prepared for the day when they could keep rank in the armies of Israel. Glory! Boys, they prepared for the day when they could keep rank in the armies of Israel. They prepared. It was part of their responsibility. In Israel, arrows were a very effective weapon against the enemy. If you could just, you know, put your mind here for a minute, it's one thing to pull out a sword and stand face to face with the enemy. It's another thing to pull out an arrow and put it in a bow and stand back about a hundred feet and shoot. If you can do that, you have a very effective weapon at your hands. Now, in Israel's day, in Bible days, there were no factories where arrows were made. You couldn't go down to the store, to the local sporting goods store, and buy arrows. Most of the time, the soldiers in Israel, they made their own arrows. They made their own. <clears throat> Every young man was an expert in their weapons of war. It was a big issue. Arrows were a big issue. These arrows needed to be straight. If an arrow is not straight, it will not go where you want it to go. So it was very important that the arrows would be straight. Those soldiers took great care at making straight, sharp arrows. Imagine how it was. There's a father sitting by the side of his house at a time when there was no war, making arrows. There he has his arrows in his hand. He's got his little knife in his hand, and he's there working on these arrows. Where do you think his mind is at while he's working on these arrows? We all know where that soldier's mind is at while he's there working on that arrow, holding it up there, eyeing it a bit, seeing it a little crooked right here. Back down he goes again. His mind is on the enemy while he is working on that arrow. There's no question about it. He saw himself standing before the enemies of the God of Israel. And he would shave some off and hold it up to give it his eye. Shave a little more off and hold it up to give it his eye. This is the way he did. All the while thinking, thinking that of where this arrow might go someday. And all the while planning that when the time comes, when he stands before the enemy and he reaches in to his quiver and pulls out one of those arrows and puts it in the bow and pulls it back, he knows this arrow must hit the mark. Now, with these soldiers, hitting the mark was no problem. They were expert at it. The problem was not hitting the mark because of their ability. The problem was, I must have an arrow that will go straight because I know how to make it. I know how to aim it straight, but I must have an arrow that when I put it in that bow, it will go right to the place where I want it to go. This is the illustration. Now we see right here, it's powerful, isn't it? That arrow must hit the mark. If it doesn't, it's useless. What good is a bunch of arrows in the back, in your quiver, if when you pull them out and you aim over here, it goes over there? No value at all. The practical applications, if we can, just remember the four comparisons. A godly father is a man, a spiritual man. He sees into the eternal. He sees a spiritual war over righteousness and the souls of men. This war has high stakes. He sees an enemy. The enemy is a wicked king. This enemy has a wicked kingdom. And this enemy is fighting against God and against righteousness and against anybody who is standing for God or righteousness. 
This is a godly father. And lastly, he sees his children. These, my children, they are the weapons that are in his hand, which are sent forth to hit a mark in the enemy's camp. That is the illustration. These weapons are spiritual youth, prepared with care for battles. Note that. They are not prepared with care so you can sit them beside your house. They are prepared with care for battle. There's a big difference between those two goals. Joy fills the heart of this godly father as he dreams of the day when he will have his quiver full of these kind of arrows. He, his heart fills with joy as he dreams of that, and together with his wife, they rise up with their whole heart to raise a quiver full of arrows that will hit the mark. Brothers and sisters, that's what we need to do. We need to rise up with our wives and with all of our heart, prepare a quiver full of children who will hit the mark when God decides to shoot them somewhere. This is no little endeavor, by the way. It takes this husband and wife 40 years to do this. But that's all right. When you shoot one of these arrows, they do all kinds of damage. It's worth a 40-year investment, no doubt about it. <clears throat> they take special care in everything they do. Each one of these, my children, must hit the mark. God has a plan for every one of my children. I don't know what it is. I don't know where God's going to shoot them. But I know that every one of them must be prepared so that when God picks it up and shoots it, it'll hit the mark and do damage to Satan's kingdom and bring glory and honor to God. That's what God has in his heart. In a war, nothing is more valuable than an arrow that will hit the mark. Amen. Nothing is more valuable than that. Oh, happy is the man that has his quiver full of arrows that will hit the mark when he pulls it out and shoots it. I don't know. I don't know about you. I don't know where you're at in your own heart, how deep your vision or your dedication or your determination goes. But as for me, and my house, we are making arrows. We are making arrows. And we're, we're shaving them off and holding them up to look at the eye. And we're shaving them off and we're holding them up to give them a good eye to see if they're straight. And we're going to shave them off a bit more and hold them up there so that we can look at them with our eye. We are making arrows at our house that will hit the mark, brothers and sisters. With purpose, with determination, with a goal in mind, with a goal in mind. <clears throat> it takes a lot of time and effort to make arrows like that, but these arrows must hit the mark. They must hit the mark. The mark is the enemy and his territory. The mark is some place of service in this old world to build God's kingdom. That's the mark. A statement I hear many times, it troubles me. I probably don't hear it as much anymore. They wouldn't say it around me, but I hear it. And that's this statement. I hear people say, well, my children will turn out all right. I think my children will turn out all right. <clears throat> they'll make it somehow. It'll be okay. Well, this statement lacks much purpose and vision, if you ask me. I don't want children that just turn out all right. I don't want just children that will fit into a church somewhere and sit on a bench somewhere, and that's where they'll be for the next 20 or 30 years. That's not what I'm aiming at. Bless God, I'd rather see them there than out in the, into the heathen world. But I want more than that for my children. I don't want them to just turn out all right. I want them to be one of those arrows that God can look down at someday and say, 
There's one. Reach out of that. Pull it out of that quiver. Put it in his bowl and shoot it somewhere. <clears throat> My sights are set higher than all right. The fields are white and the laborers are few, brothers and sisters. And the Lord will use every arrow that he can find. You can be sure of it. He'll use everyone that he can find. Everyone that has been prepared to hit the mark. God will pick it up and God will use it. Turn with me to Isaiah. As we go on to the next picture of promise this morning. Isaiah chapter 58, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the next portrait, a many generation foundation. A many generation foundation. Just to give a little short background here, Isaiah chapter 58 is one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible, by the way. It's a chapter about fasting, biblical fasting. It is an Old Testament example of a New Testament spirit-filled life. It has hidden within it all the secrets and all the requirements for revival in your life, whether it's personally, whether it's corporately, whether it's in your family. It has all those things hidden in it. This one chapter in Isaiah chapter 58 it is a beautiful example of what New Testament reality is all about. In here, we see that God is a covenant-keeping God. God says, if you will do this, then I will do this. And because God is a covenant-keeping God, you will find these words often in the Bible in the middle of this covenant-keeping God's words. You'll find the word, the big little word, if, and you'll also find the word, then. God says, if you will do this, then I will do this. And God never lies. Amen? He is a covenant-keeping God. His integrity will cause him to do what he said he will do every time. Hallelujah. I'm glad for that. All right, let's read. Let's read in, in Isaiah chapter 58. And we can't read the whole chapter because of time. But we're going to focus in on verse 9 through 12. And uh, that's as far as we'll go. Verse 9, God says, Then, that's after a few ifs that we haven't read here. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Now that's worth something, isn't it? When you call, and the Lord answers. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, he, the Lord, he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now in this text there are three major truths that I would like for us to look at here for just a few moments. The first one is simply this. In this whole chapter, God says to us, we must be rightly related to Him. That's the first thing. That's the truth that comes out of Isaiah 58. They were wanting to fast. They were trying to twist God's arm, make God do what they wanted Him to do because they were going without eating. And God was trying to help them to see, you don't twist my arm and make me do something by just, uh, by just going without eating. You must be rightly related to me. And so, we see that so clearly here. We must be rightly related to God through brokenness and repentance, turning away from sins of commission and also sins of omission. You'll see them both in there, by the way. The purpose of the fast is to draw nigh to God. Then, when the upward look is right, principle number two, God's flow of grace begins to happen in your life. 
This experience is described in clear words in our text. We see the outshining of God upon this individual who has gotten right with him. We see so clearly God's voice leading them. That's the spirit-filled life, by the way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Walk after the dictates of the spirit, not after the dictates of the flesh, it says in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. God's clear voice leading us. We see water, amen, overflowing water in these verses. And it's not talking about the kind that I have in my cup up here this morning. Bless God, it's talking about the fountain of living water, which is God. It is God. And also it speaks about a healthy body there. Let's go for this, my brothers and sisters, with all of our heart this week. And I do have confidence that that's exactly what you're doing this week. You're going for it with all of your heart. Number three, once we get rightly related to God, then God's grace begins to flow into our life. And all of these beautiful things happen. But one thing that we want to focus on here is that after the flow of God's grace comes in, then there is an outflow of God's grace. And this is where ministry happens. In fact, if there's no outflow or inflow into your life, you will have no ministry. You may be able to make noise. You may be able to do things. You may be able to have lots of activity. But until there is an inflow and an outflow of the grace of God, you have no ministry whatsoever. Mark that down. So, God begins to focus on that in verse 12, where the ministry begins. <clears throat> and God describes it in verse 12. And it's the whole verse there of verse 12. But I would like for us just to notice the one. One of the fruits of this powerful, spirit-filled life is a many-generation foundation. A many-generation foundation. Or a foundation in your home that is so strong, that is so powerful, that is so influential, that many generations come forth out of it. The foundation of your life becomes an impetus for righteousness in many generations to come. Oh, glory. Do you see it? Do you see that? It's awesome. It's awesome to me. Everyone knows that the foundation is the true strength of any house. Amen? I mean, you have to dig deep if you want a good, strong house. With the skyscrapers. It's very clear, you know, what they're doing. When they're ready to build one of these buildings, you know, 30, 40... 50 stories high, they dig way down into the ground because they know they need a strong foundation to hold a big, high structure. Brothers and sisters, it is the same with the house that we build. There must be a deep and a strong foundation if you want a beautiful structure to come up and grow for many generations. It must be that way. The question is this. Here are the practical lessons this morning. What kind of house do you want? What kind of house do you want? What kind of foundation are you laying? A one-story slab house needs three or four inches of concrete, and that's all you need. You can put a little house on the top of it. No big deal. What kind of house do you want? That is the question. How many generations do you want your foundation to hold? One? One half? Two? Four? What kind of house do you want? That is the challenge this morning. It's a practical challenge. God says, if you will love me with all your heart, and walk in my ways, I will pour out my spirit upon you, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Beautiful. Remember, we gave the illustration of William Booth, his home, and Hudson Taylor's home, and I focused in on many, many of these homes 
in the home histories, in the Remnant magazine, but in every one of those situations. They are an example of this verse right here. There was a father and a mother who loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they followed God with all their zeal and with all their love. And there were children who lived in their house. Those children cannot help but be affected by living with parents who are on fire for God. They cannot help it. I mean, here they are. They're open. They're innocent little children. There they are. They're in this atmosphere. They're in this home. They're wide open to be taught anything. If they live in a house where there's a fanatic father and a fanatic mother, and by that I mean somebody who loves God, yes, who loves God extravagantly, those children will be affected by that. No question about it. Consider with me this morning. Think about it deeply. You are the foundation of the next generation. You are. And they are the foundation of the next. And on it goes. The next generation of children will grow up on you. On you. Who you really are in the Lord. Not who you are. Put on to be on Sunday morning when you're with everybody else and you know what you're supposed to do and say, but who you really are in the Lord. That is the foundation for the next generation in your household. Awesome words. Sobering words. Who you really are. In convictions, in character, who you are behind Closed doors is the foundation for the next generation of children that come forth from you. <clears throat> awesome thoughts. This can only be done in the Lord, but in the Lord it can be done. Let's believe it. Let's believe it. Now let's examine our foundations a bit. Just share a little of our testimony, Jackie and I. Twenty some years ago... It began to dawn on us as God was opening our eyes to all of what we're saying here this week. Some 20 years ago, 20 some years ago, it began to dawn on us that something was wrong in many of the homes. I noticed in the churches that I knew that many were losing their children. These were the best evangelical churches that I knew of. They were losing many of their children to the world. Now, my observations covered several denominations, but obviously not all of them, but Bible churches, Christian Missionary Alliance, Baptist, Charismatic, those were the ones that I was familiar with, and I looked around with a discerning eye, and I looked and I said, something is wrong. All these children, whoosh, are going out into the world. They live like the world, they act like the world, they talk like the world, they look like the world. They're worldly. Something's wrong. What's wrong? I had to begin to ask myself. The youth did not rise up and serve the Lord with their whole heart and with their whole life. Now many of them stayed in church, but they were lukewarm, they were worldly, they were the Sunday morning type, you know, show up there, praise the Lord, hallelujah, go live my own selfish life the rest of the week. By the way, there's something wrong if that's all you got. You got about a one-quarter foundation right there. That's all you got if you got them to do that. Others of them, they just went out into the world whole hog to the pain of their parents and the shame of their parents and the embarrassment of their parents. They just went out into the world whole hog. I, lo I saw this. The girls, oh, the girls, they were wearing sensuous attire and they had their makeup on and I mean the dating game was in full swing in these churches and these dangerous practices brought fornication and other male moral failures into the lives of the young people. And I looked at that and with a discerning eye I said, if I hang around here, that's what's going to happen to my young people. I'm not going to hang around here. I will not have that with mine. That was my heart. Now, this, it wasn't this way in all of them, please. I don't want to be too hard. But it was enough that way to alert any discerning father and mother, something has gone array. 
the foundation wasn't very deep. Many times it could not hold even one generation. Some of the parents said, Oh, that's just the way it is today. But as I began to study and study, I realized they have already given up. After careful study in these texts that we've been looking at, I said, God has a better way for mine. God has a better way. I said in my own heart, this is not normal. Normal is youth who love God and serve Him in purity all the days of their youthful life. That's normal. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us free ourselves, ourselves and our children from this generational curse. I hadn't made the connection back then that I know now, the connection that is between the parents and the children, I didn't realize back then that the reason why all these children are going out into the world is because their parents are fakes. I didn't realize it. I just looked at it and said, this doesn't look good to me, and I don't think I want to go this way. I'm bailing out. But now I know. The reason why all those children were doing all those things that they were doing and going off into the world and playing Sunday Christianity is because that's what they got from their father and mother. That was the reality of it all. And oh, those are sobering words to us when we consider how many generation foundation do we have if we measure the measure of who we really are in the Lord. Every one of us that is here. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, again, let us free ourselves and our children from this generational curse. Let us repent. Let us repent. Because they will be, basically, they will be where we are, like it or not. What kind of, what kind of foundation are we laying this morning? That's the question that every one of us need to ask. <clears throat> Let's look at America 200 years ago. Years ago, I read an article in a homeschool magazine. I don't remember the magazine. I don't remember the article. I wish I did. I didn't know I'd need to remember it, but I don't remember it. But I remember the facts of the article very clearly. It was a challenging article on the goals and dreams of education in our land. It was very revealing to my modern mind. I realized as I read it, oh, how far we have fallen. And it is good for us to consider in light of laying a foundation that supports many generations. Note the, the, the high points of this article. America, 200 years ago. Children began to learn Greek and Hebrew at the age of six so they could study the Bible when they were older. Children, at the age of 10, the children had put off silly-mindedness and were preparing for real life. Young men entered Bible colleges to study and prepare for the ministry at age 12. <clears throat> these young men, in order to get into these Bible colleges, they had to be able to diagram a paragraph. That means divide it up, noun, verb, adverb, adjective, preposition, all of that in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. They had to be able to parse all those verses in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Age 12. I was awestruck when I read it. This was part of the entrance exam for these Bible colleges, you know, like Yale and Princeton and Harvard. And things sure have changed, haven't they? It was normal 200 years ago. It was normal for a 12-year-old boy to be able to operate his father's business while he slipped away for a day or two. <clears throat> the land was full of young ladies who could guide their homes in every area while mom was away for a day or two. 12-year-old girls who could run their whole house. It was normal. Everywhere you went, you saw it that way. Everywhere you went, there were fathers who could slip away from their business, and there was a fine 12-year-old boy who stepped up and took his dad's place and started making things happen. Hallelujah. God, do it again. Do it again. Oh, how we've fallen. 
200 years ago, America had three books to read. The Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, and Fox's Book of Martyrs. Amen? Unless you lived in this area, then they had uh, Martyr's Mirror. But bless God, they weren't feeding on all this nonsense that the young people and the children are feeding on in America today. And I guarantee you, it's not turning out the same kind of fruit either. Now it's easy for us to say, oh, how far education has fallen and but what about our own ideals about training children? It could be that we have also fallen while we look out there and say education has fallen. Maybe we've fallen further than we realize also. Christian parents, have you fallen into the same trap? Consider, consider. Do we believe it's good for children to work and do their chores at an early age? I know. City life has changed a lot of that. The family farm kind of leaned that way, you know. I mean, you had to have help. We were on the family farm. One man couldn't do it all. But the question is, what is your view of that today? As you sit here and hear it, do you think, my, that's terrible to do that to a little boy. Why don't you let the little boy have a little fun? Yeah, you let that little boy have a little fun, and he'll still be having fun when he's 21. What about the mental disciplines? How about memorizing many portions of scripture? Do we look at our children and say, my children can memorize scriptures. I'm going to guide them this way. I'm going to give them the opportunities. I'm going to sit them down and work with them. I'm going to put them in a room where they can memorize chapters of the Bible so that when they grow up, they are full of the word of God. Do we look at it that way? Is it okay to train your children to run the house or the business by the age of 12? Or do we look at that as a terrible thing on poor Johnny boy? Here in Lancaster County, we see it all the time, bless God. I mean, when I moved here, I started taking notes. You know, I looked around, I saw these little boys out there jumping in there, doing their work. Well, that one of the first jobs that I had was uh, repairing uh, uh, electric motors and one of the other ones was repairing, uh, repairing uh, small engines. Bless God, one of the most embarrassing things was this nine-year-old boy that would come up and stand next to me at my workbench and say, no, you don't do it that way. You do it that, this way. Here, give it to me. And he would fix it right in front of my eyes, nine years old. Oh, man. But I was taking notes while I was embarrassed, you can be sure. What's our attitude? How do we look at it? Have we given in to the philosophies of this world? Hmm? And we don't know it? I tremble at the silly reading materials that go on these days instead of a, just a good old King James Bible, amen? All oh, the nonsense that our children are growing up on. We Americans think that childhood is fun and play, and we want to extend it as long as we can for little Johnny boy. This did not our forefathers and it produced serious-minded, mature young people who could run their households at the age of 12. Do it again, Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm raising adults, not children. And there's a big difference between the two of those. I agree with Eve when she said, as she held her first little baby in her hands, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Do you ever ponder that? That's what Eve said. Oh, she had this little boy in her hands, and she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Have you gotten a man from the Lord? Or did you get a little baby, a little fella, who's going to run around and play and goof off all his life? Which one is it? I'm raising adults. There's a difference in the goal you have, in what you see. If while you work with them all the time, you see one of those mature plants standing there, ready to bear fruit at an early age, you're surely going to guide that plant differently than if you look at it and say, well, someday, someday he'll get straightened out. Someday he'll do something for God. Until then, don't let the poor fella have too hard of a life, you know. Let him have his fun and play and his goofing off. And I tell you what, that, that whole mentality has ruined uh, several generations of children. The goal is adults, brothers and sisters. 
We have enough children in this land that are 21 years old. Still filled with play and frolic and jokes and silly mindedness and I'm one of them. I was 23 years old before I finally woke up and realized there's a real life to live. And that's when I got born again. All of a sudden my eyes were opened up and I realized, uh oh, I am way behind. And by the way, I feel it all the time, even to this day. I feel way behind. But bless God, we're going to do better. We're going to do better with ours. There's lots of talk about revival these days, and I'm glad for all of it. Praise God. I believe in revival. I pray for revival. We need revival. No doubt about it. I pray for a visitation from God upon Charity Christian Fellowship. I pray God make us like that Chinese church. By the way, it seemed a bit Chinese around here in that prayer meeting this morning. I really appreciated that. That fervency is, is good and it's healthy. But listen to me. If all we think of when we think about revival is preaching and souls getting saved, we have only seen half the picture, remember? Two ways, two ways, not one. It's not just winning souls. I believe in that, but it's raising up a godly seed. One of the clear biblical fruits of true revival is a family that loves God with their whole hearts. If your revival has not touched your family, it's spurious. It's spurious. Because the Spirit of God is brooding over the hearts of the fathers, turning the hearts of the fathers toward the children, and brooding over the hearts of the children, turning the hearts of the children to the fathers. That's what the Spirit of God is doing. We need revival this week. We need revival. One that will purify and sanctify and empower us to lay a many generation foundation in our homes. Will we pay the price? That's the question. Will we pay the price of the long-term commitment that it takes in order to produce a generation of children who grow up and love God? That's the question. And the greatest price that you could pay is the price that you pay along with God as you wait before Him and allow Him to probe your heart to such a depth that He can find your heart to such a yieldedness that He could honor you by pouring His Spirit out in your heart, in your life. That is the greatest thing you can do for the foundation of the generations to come is to be filled with the Holy Ghost and walk in that filling every day of your life. You can't do anything more for your children than that. Nothing is higher than that goal. We need a revival this week. Amen. But we are so busy, aren't we? Oh, as Americans, we are so busy. Our busyness is killing us and our families. We need to get back to the basics. We live in an unusual society, brothers and sisters. We live in a society where it's easy to make lots of money. We are a nation of men that will be rich. And this is destroying the foundation of our homes. It's easy to be successful today, but the question is what? is success. A big pile of money or a bunch of arrows in a quiver ready to go? Which one is success? That's the question. The prisons are overflowing. The divorce rates are on the increase. The streets are dangerous for us to walk in. I talked to a brother here just last evening who was down in the prison crusade for, for a week here not long ago. And he came with tears running down his face. And, and he said, Brother Denny, they're all in there. They're all in there because they didn't have a dad. Maybe we're putting the wrong ones in prison. Amen. Yes, we need a revival. Listen to this and it will be done. We need a revival. But the end time move of God's spirit will be a mighty move of God that will move the hearts of the parents and turn their hearts toward their children and move the hearts of those children and turn them toward their parents. It will do it. Our children are the most precious possession that we have. May God open our eyes.
to the reality of it. Let's pray. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you this morning, God, for your word. It is precious. Thank you, Lord, for those songs that preceded your word this morning. We believe, Lord, yes, the promises, they give us a bright today and a bright hope for tomorrow, Lord. God, we do not despair this morning, though it may be hard to sit and hear and examine where we are at, but, oh, Father, our hearts rise up this morning in faith and confidence and trust in you. You are well able, you are well able to help us with all these things. Oh, God, please do help us with our children, we pray in Jesus' Christ's name, amen.